Hello, welcome to Big Bang Radio Spotlights. This is a show where we talk to independent artists from all around the world all about their music and their process for making it. I'm your host, Isaac Anderson, and today I get to sit down with singer-songwriter Kate Rudy. Without any further ado, here's the interview. Kate, thank you so much for joining us today. We really do appreciate it. Uh, I want to start at the beginning of your musical journey, and uh, it sounds like you have a pretty rich history in music, but I'm just really curious. What is your earliest musical memory? My earliest musical memory would probably be um, my sister and my mom uh, playing violin. Uh, well, my mom playing the piano and me and my sister playing the violin, but probably just practicing next to the piano and taping our practices. Heard that, heard that. So I imagine you you come from a pretty musical family, right? Yeah, my mom is in church choir and my dad played guitar in college, but me and my sister both grew up on the on the violin, so. Well, how exactly did you get started uh, playing music? Uh, were they very big in like putting you into lessons or was that something that like you made a big effort to do yourself? I, I don't know, how exactly did that come to be? They definitely kept me in lessons. I wanted to quit a lot, but um, we also, my family has um, a cabin in uh, Southwest Virginia and we summered there, or <laughs> like summered, we just went there every once in a while and often during fillers convention seasons. So they knew I liked the recital part of classical violin lessons. So they encouraged us. And I took Suzuki, which was learning by ear. And that fits really well with like fiddling and learning tunes and stuff like that. So they got us into the fillers conventions, which put us in front of a lot of people. Was there a moment where you uh, you really thought this music thing was something that wasn't just going to be a hobby? This was going to be like something you actually want to form a career in? Like, was there like a definitive moment, or was like there just no question at all? I'm not sure if there was a definitive moment, but um, I got really into sports in high school, and then kind of wanted to do sports in college, and then realized it was way too late and no like to get on any sort of team. I had no idea how like scouting worked or anything like that, so I majored in music since that was one of the only things I was good at at the time. And then uh, I did music therapy and, and music industries a year and a half in both at App State. And while I was there, I joined a bunch of bands and that was just so much more interesting to me than the school. And that's where I wanted to spend my time. So kind of just doing that. like playing with like all these different acts and a lot of them grew to be like wildly you know successful too you know how was it playing kind of like you know um like in, in those groups and were you ever like oh, i don't want to be in the back i want to be in the front you know like or was it just like are you just a servant to music on that well it, there's like certain like freedom to you know playing the fiddle and harmonizing and you don't have that pressure of being the front man, but eventually I was uh, just like, I think I can, I think I'd like to sing more than one song, sing lead on more than one song during a show, or I think it was probably when I had enough songs that I was like, I could play a set, like I have four or five songs. And that was when I was like, okay, I can fill a 30 minute slot, maybe. Obviously, like, you know, you, you've been all around the place touring and everything, and you've seen um, all sorts of different cities. There's an awesome song on your first album that, like, kind of describes some, some of the experiences you've had in all the different cities. That's really fun. But uh, being in Nashville is such a, a, a rich place for, for music, but I feel like it can be really overwhelming for many people. Like, even though, like, you could be a fantastic, like, one of the greatest musicians ever, but, like, there's just so much of it. It just feels like, like, I don't, I don't even know where to start at that. Like, you know, how did you feel when you first got there? Well, when I first got there, I was locked out of my house. <laughs> but I have um, I have friends in Nashville, so I like, I have a family that I'm friends with in Nashville, and you know they kept me kind of feeling like I had 
some people to fall back on. It, it was a little bit overwhelming at first. I think the reason I didn't end up doing as much music as I wanted to was because I just didn't know where to start. And so, yeah, scooping ice cream and dog sitting kind of was what that summer turned into at least. But since I've been back to Nashville, I've been back for a couple shows at, uh, I forget the name. It's one of those three that are stacked on top of each other. You know what I'm talking about? I think I think so. I can't think of the name of it, though. Like the Cannery Ballroom and then something else and then something else. I played I played there and I've, I've played, I've opened for people, Station Inn and a couple of like, went there for Americana Fest and even going back, like I feel much more comfortable now, but going back and, you know, I still feel kind of like a fly on the wall, like I'll maybe know one or two people at an event and it's kind of fun to just, it's kind of fun to, to not have that pressure quite yet of having to talk to anybody. I got to like kind of just be a fly on the wall and almost eavesdrop on conversations. And um, I don't know, when I was in Nashville, when I moved there for the summer and worked at Ben and Jerry's, I remember Allison Krauss came in and I served her ice cream and her and her guitar player, Dan Tymanski. And at one point she had her back to me and I mouthed at Dan Tymanski. And he was like, and I thought that was really cute. And then um, I think I had to cry afterwards. I think my manager was like, get to the back now. And I was like, I'm sorry. But um, when I was back there for Americana Fest, I remember I did feel pretty like overwhelmed and like a little bit out of place at maybe this industry event. And I went to eat my chicken sandwich in the corner and ended up talking to this older guy. And he was the guy that built Allison Krauss' studio. And I was like, this is so strange. When I went back to the station in, I... um. I love Gillian Welch, but I was opening a show for um, Willie Watson, and he uh, plays with Dave and Gillian. And I remember Gillian Welch showed up at the show. Like, she didn't see my set, but she showed up right after, and she just said, excuse me, to me at one point to get to her seat. I was still, I was still, I played, I was playing the show, but I still felt like such a little fly on the wall. I was like, anything you need, Gillian. You wrote a lot of songs while you were performing for other people and everything, and obviously you uh, started performing live just, you know, with those songs. Do you remember the first time you started playing your original music, like, in front of people and those sets? Like, I, do you remember what that first show was like? I think it had to have been at the Appalachian Mountain Brewery in Boone. And I remember I had, I think, five songs, and I was working on an EP with some recording majors at App for, like, one of their projects. And that was the first EP I did. And I do think it was like me and my guitar at Appalachian Mountain Brewery, free beer, all my friends came. There were flannels, I don't know. It was exciting. When, when you write your music, what was that process like? Do you tend to try to go with the, the music first or is it like everything's you know about the lyrics and literally everything comes after that? I, I don't know, everybody's different about this, I'm curious. Yeah, um, my songwriting process is kind of long. I think um, I think it used to be easier for me to finish a song, but these days it usually starts out just with a thought or a lyric and I write it down. And maybe it has a melody, and if it has a melody, I'll rec record the one line on my voice memo and then maybe try to figure out what the chords are for it later. That's, I think that's where it usually starts, but I, I definitely lean towards lyrics first, I think. When you craft your lyrics, uh, do you tend to go from like a straight experiential standpoint? Uh, do you try to craft stories with them, go for more, more for phonetics? Uh, when I listen to your music, I feel like there's a lot of personal stuff in there. Uh, and, you know, especially with the song, like, I don't like you or your band. Um, like, that's just, it's a very funny song, but like, it's so real. Like, you paint such an awesome picture of this person. Like, I can almost see him standing right in front of me. Or a song like Dance It Away, where it's got like this really cool groove, but like, you know, the lyrics, it's almost kind of like, it's heartbreaking reading some of those lyrics and everything, too. It's like, oh, this is like an actual kind of, like, it, I love the contrast of it. I, I don't know. But in your eyes, like, how exactly do you go about doing that? I don't think I could have written I Don't Like You or Your Band if that hadn't happened to me. Um, and same with the Dance It Away thing, or just any song in general, it's usually, I wish I was more creative and came up with narratives and could put myself in a whole different shoe, but definitely most of, 
I think my my favorite parts too of songs that I write are like the very the kind of inside jokes or details of a specific experience that happened. So, yeah, mostly I write from experience. Obviously, you um, you stay pretty busy with the music. You have a lot of fans uh, from all over the place. You've been touring around with lots of people, but uh, obviously now with COVID, uh, most everything's online. But uh, regardless, what is a typical day for you like? Do you tend to try to set time aside every single day for music, or do you just kind of wait for it to come out of inspiration? I, I don't know. How exactly do you regiment your days? Yeah, I, I wish I was more disciplined about having a specific time to practice or write, but it's usually very sporadic. Like I keep my guitar hanging, like I keep it available and ready for me if I want to pull it out. And I probably do once or twice a day, but these days, in a kind of a nice way, but also, you know, difficult way, there's not a lot of pressure. Like there's no shows I need to be practicing for, you know, there's uh, no tours I need to be getting ready for. So having that kind of leisure, to get like a lot of creativity, but also like a lot of like quieter moments. So probably my day, it just depends what it looks like. Like the past two days I've been recording and that's still kind of like playtime like it doesn't feel like work because we don't have a deadline we don't have any of that pressure because the industry is so quiet right now which i think has actually helped us like have more fun and make that a better experience but obviously we mentioned earlier that you are in nashville tennessee but you uh, eventually moved back to raleigh which is where you're located right now um what, what was kind of like the big thing about um, why you wanted to move back to Raleigh? And what is the local music scene like there? Obviously with COVID, it's not really, you know, a whole lot of live shows, but uh, for people that don't know, how is the music scene kind of in your local area for your kind of music? It's great. Yeah, I, well, I moved, I dropped out of school in Boone. Um, it only made sense for me to come back to Raleigh, really. I didn't really feel like going anywhere new. Um, and I didn't want to be in Boone anymore. Boone is amazing, but it's so small. And I had I had the richest experiences, the best and the worst of times, and I just couldn't be there anymore. So I moved back to Raleigh and began integrating myself kind of into the music scene, but probably more so the restaurant scene, to be honest. And I'm still getting to know the local music scene and the whole local scene like every I think I've learned more about it in the past year even though COVID is paused than I did in the first couple because I, I don't really know why that was but I maybe just branched out a little bit more and started going to more shows but we have a pretty fantastic music scene we have some really amazing venues like the Four House and the Good Witch and Martin. Really great spots, and I've gotten to know like the owners of those places, and they've become friends. And I think it's just a very um, personal music scene. Obviously, you know, in, in your musical career, you've worked with a lot of awesome musicians. Like we mentioned before, you've played with a lot all over the place, and specifically. Um, I'm, I'm referring to your uh, relationship with uh, Andrew Marlin uh, of Mandolin Orange and just Mandolin Orange in general. I believe last yeah. year, near the beginning of last year, you went on tour with them um, all over the place, and I, you know, it, it looked like you guys had an awesome time, played to these big theaters and everything. How exactly did you get uh, hooked up with those guys, specifically Andrew, but like just Mandolin, Or uh, Mandolin Orange in general? And uh, how did you go about working together? Because eventually you and Andrew worked on records together. Mm-hmm. Um, we were introduced by a mutual friend, uh, my friend Libby. She's a fiddle player. She plays in the band Nipso. And uh, she went to school with my sister. And so that's why I, we kind of knew each other and knew each other from around. And uh, I mentioned to her that he had just he had just produced one of their records. And I mentioned to her that I would like him to produce one of my records one day. And she was like, why not this one? Like, why not the first one? Just text him. I'm sure he'll, he'll want to do it. And so I did. And we did the record. And then recording the first one is so, fu it's funny to me to be recording a second one because 
we're just like we're more of like buddies now and so it's more like just shooting and having fun instead of me kind of quietly hoping I won't like embarrass myself or something like that but you know they've taken me on a couple tours and they've had me I think the first time I played with them was when they had a show at the art museum in Raleigh and they had me up for one of the songs that was on my record and they had me up for their set and it was incredible but yeah they've been really really good to me and they're good friends and they're great people all of them uh, in your mind what would you be doing if you weren't creating music I would uh, marry rich and become a mom I don't know I don't know um, I think you know, this has to do with music, so like I was going to say if I wasn't performing, I'd like to produce, and like I think I could be really good at that, maybe, if I learned how to do it. But that's still kind of music related. So I think it would have to be something completely opposite from what I'm doing now. So it either, um, I would have to become really good at landscaping, or a design or something. I don't know. It would have to be like completely separate, because music industry and music therapy did not work out for me. I don't know. The, the first record you did with, uh, with Andrew, um, Rock and Roll Ain't For Me, I believe is the name of it. Um, it it's full of a lot of awesome um, songs, like right out, right out the gate. It's just got like this really cool kind of feel. Um, it's got really amazing songwriting. Like I said, I don't, I don't mean to be a dead horse, but you know, it's got pretty much everything that makes your music great in there. Uh, what was it like recording that record? Um, were these songs that like that you had uh, just over time, did, like you, you kind of built up your, in your repertoire, or was like these ones that you went in there? And it's like, well, I'm making a record. These are ones for the record. No, those are pretty much all the songs I had written at that time, and so there was probably a compilation of like five, four or five years of writing music. And um, I didn't know what they were gonna sound like with the band. And Andrew didn't know my style very well. So we just took, like he didn't, we didn't know each other very well or what, what was gonna happen. So we took every song and did it like bare bones, like started it, we just played it together. And, and then we were like, okay, well we should just start with the guitars. And then we would be like, okay, let's add some banjo. Let's do this, let's do this. And it, it was kind of like these like, think building blocks that we just put it together. And um, that was really neat. It ended up, it was like, it's very string bandy, definitely the first record is. Um, but it was super skeletal, the way it was, the songs were formed. Well, what, what, what was like going through your head when you were recording that record? Like, did it, did it get easier or, or like, was it like, I, like, I can't believe I'm, I'm here. I I'm, I'm can't believe I'm working with this guy the whole time. Well, I, so I've been a fan of Mandel and Orange since I was uh, like 15. My sister introduced me to them and they've been like my shower crying songs. I've seen them perform a couple of times. And so it was a little bit surreal and I was definitely trying to like take myself seriously. And then these dudes just keep making inappropriate joke after inappropriate joke in a good way, you know, not like in an uncomfortable way, but they just keep like, just like messing around and it. you just, I just really, lightened up I think after that I was like also I was just stressed out because it was my first record and I, I just didn't want to I wanted to really know what I was doing and it was okay that I didn't and then also um I just think I got more comfortable because they are just funny and talented and they don't care how many times they mess up and they'll try a guitar take for an hour which some might say waste time but you know it's always worth it and it keeps it right so it became a lot easier to get more comfortable. Now, I kind of want to go on to uh, some of your most recent music. So you recently put out a 7-inch with uh, your single Dancing Away and your most recent single, Snake. And um, um, Dancing Away has got quite a couple streams. Snake does, too. Uh, all your songs have a lot of streams, but these are, are really, like, uh, Dancing Away is a little bit different from uh, your, your first album. Like, it, it still has a lot of those hallmarks of what make your music your music, but it's got, uh, it's got this kind of a different feel. It's almost like a, a dancey kind of song, and Snake is very kind of stripped down. Okay. Yeah, it's cool. I, I like it. I, like, I can see your music video. You're like, you're skating in it and everything. You get the lights going. It's really, really yeah. cool. Uh, I li I've listened to that song I don't know how many times. But um, um, in, in your mind, what do those songs m mean to you? And like, what was the process like maybe writing them and recording them? So those songs were 
written kind of in the same period of time. I would say near the beginning of 2019, maybe. And then um, I was just thinking that those songs, they sounded very different when I wrote them. Maybe not Snake so much, but Dance It Away, definitely. And I just had a bunch of songs that were going to be on the second album, and they were on there. And my friend Jack Hallenbeck, he was in town. He moved from New York with his girlfriend to live with his parents for the summer. And Jack and I made music in high school together. He had a recording studio up in his attic, and that's what we would do after, like, soccer practice as me and my friend David would go and record music with Jack and they had this band called LR Stereo and they made it like they made like 200 copies of the CDs and I have like 50 of them and it was just us messing around and doing that and so he went to NYU for recording school and then he came home and we wanted to just try our hand at recording some songs and he doesn't usually do folk and I think that was fun for him and I don't usually do I don't really know anything about pop or production like that but he's worked with like Topaz Jones and Maggie Rogers and we thought that kind of collab like that style would go that would fit and Jack picked out Dance It Away and Snake out of the songs that I sent him that he heard things on so we pretty much just you know after around all summer um recording in his childhood bedroom and then a little bit in his uh house in LA last September or two Septembers ago yeah 2019 like I mentioned before like dancing away like when like it's gotten this really fun rhythm to it but like uh the the story of that song if you don't mind kind of getting into that like what 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 was your kind of inspiration for writing that song that was a very in the moment song and I remember I wrote it mostly I had just moved into a house with three other roommates and I had this one roommate and we both didn't really have anything going on. She didn't have a job and I had my industry job and I remember I had just gone through a breakup and my antidepressants were starting to kick in and I had this feeling of um, euphoria. I think I had like this upswing but still like would notice like, you know, intrusive thoughts kind of coming in and trying to invade. And I remember trying to figure out a way to describe like to another, it's like I was having a conversation with another person about what I was thinking or feeling. It's just like, how do you explain to somebody, I'm going to come out of this fog, but you have to give me a second to do that. Or we just need to shake this off but I need to explain to you first that I might be in my head for a little bit. I don't know. I was definitely coming out of a mental fog during that time and trying to figure out how to do that. I was having a lot of bad dreams and I would wake up feeling really sad for no reason. Goodness. Well, it, well I'm sorry you had to go through some trouble, but it made for a great song. Um, oh my God. The trouble I went through. <laughs> The trouble you suffered for your art. You suffered for your Oh, art. God, the dreams. <laughs> the terrible dreams. Uh, well, um, hopping on to Snake real fast before uh, before we kind of yeah. move on. Um, um, th this one's uh, really nice and it's kind of like, it's really it's really intimate. And uh, was that something like specifically like, you know, like there's something that you were feeling at the time or was that something that you kind of had to channel from, uh, um, you know, a while back? I, I don't know. What, what exactly is the story behind those lyrics? It's about my cat, actually. And it's about my cat. And when I was writing it about my cat, other people, other people in my life who I've loved and are loving kind of worked their way into it. So the you, like the I or the you, like whoever I was talking about changes a lot. Like in one line, it might be about the cat. And I wanted it to kind of be this like stream of consciousness thought about how all of these different things and loves inform the other. Um, my cat ran away and I was thinking that, you know, I was like, well, he'll come back in due time if he wants to. Like, I can't force him to love me. And I was trying to, like, apply that lesson to my own love life. And, um, and then the whole, like, I'll leave a candle by the window because my cat got in and out of that house by my window. Like, I left my window open. So I was like, I'll leave the candle by the window, which is just already a saying. And then you know, he's clumsy, so if he knocked the candle over and the house went up in flames, then at least I know, like, at least I would know that he had come back. 
but like it also that line seems like it could be about like a scorned lover and I don't want it to not mean that because it could mean anything but it's about a cat <laughs> It's a, it's a beautiful song, regardless, no matter what it's about. And I hope a lot of people Thanks. can take away. No, no problem. Uh, I, I hope a lot of people can take away uh, what, what they can from it. But uh, what, what's next for you, uh, Kate? Uh, obviously, right now, COVID is going on right now. But uh, do you have any new music that you're working on right now? I know the answer, but the people at home don't. So why don't you go ahead and tell them? Um, yeah. So uh, we've been recording uh, album number two in quarantine and it's been, I think we've been doing it over the past six months or so. I want to say it was July or August when we had that first session at Echo Mountain. And it's, um, I'm doing it with Andrew again as the producer. And it's pretty much the cast of Mandolin Orange <laughs> minus Emily that was my band. Um, Andrew really loves those musicians and I do too. I think they're incredibly talented. And this record is, uh, the process of recording it, I guess, is, a little bit more live since I've toured with them a couple times and they know they know my music a little bit better and we know each other a little bit more so instead of doing that bare bones thing with all the skeletons we just kind of like slapped a body on that you know what I mean I know I know what you mean I, I love your, uh, I love the way you describe live. things I don't know it's not like so much as that. let's do this track and then this track and then this track we just all sit in our separate booths and play the song and then like add what it needs afterwards it's really fun. Well, if people want to kind of keep up with what's going on with your music, how can people find you online? Uh, I've got, I've got a website. It's katerudy.com. And I've got pretty much every form of social media that there is. My Instagram is Hoods Crate, which is something I made in high school. It's just a combination of the letters of my name. And then, yeah, I think I'm the same on Twitter and stuff like that, but I'm trying to not get too excited about recording an album because I don't know when it's, when it's going to be able to come out. We're not even done. We're just having fun with it right now, but it's in the works and I'm excited to share it. I just, I don't want to like overshare and not have anything to prove for it, show for it. Heard that, heard that. Well, I'm definitely excited to listen to it uh, whenever it comes out. Um, and I know the whole radio station is going to be. And I've enjoyed the heck out of talking to you, Kate. Thank you so much. But before we go, I got one more question for you. I don't know if you've ever watched a Big Bang Radio Spotlight before, but I'm a musician, but I also love film. And uh, I feel like artists of pretty much any sort have a special connection to film, specifically musicians, because um, it, it's not too many worlds away from what we do, and it combines music in that format a lot of times. So, uh, Kate, before we go, what is your favorite movie? Sound of Music. It's the classic for me. It's like a family movie. It's one that we know all the words to, probably we're saying it. Like my mom probably sang it while I was in the belly, you know. It's one of those one of those movies that if someone hasn't seen it, who I'm close to, they have to watch it. We have to watch it together. And we have to sing along to every word. And we have to wear dresses while we do it. And it never gets old. And there's an intermission. Yeah, I love how it, like yeah. the, old, the old VHS of it have the intermission in the VHS. It's like when you're young and watching, I'm like, what is this blue screen that's coming up with alert, the words on it? Oh, I have. Oh, um, you have? I have a VHS. I have tape of it. I'm looking for it. Oh, got it. Oh, sick. I did not expect you to have it that close by. Yeah, I'm, I know where everything is in my house. It's a talent I have. Thanks to Kate for sitting down with us and talking all about her music. If you guys want to see more interviews just like this, you can go to facebook.com slash studio67ncc, youtube.com slash nashcomcollege, or you can find us on Instagram at studio67ncc. Thank you all for watching. I'm Isaac Anderson, and until next time, stay lovely.